Hey there! If you love exploring Christian philosophy and theology, you're in the right place. The video is about to get started, but first, I want to ask you a question. Do you find the content I produce on this channel valuable? If so, here are some ways you can help promote it. The first is completely free. Give this video a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Second, consider doing a one-time donation, kind of like a tip. You can do this in the form of a super chat or a super thanks below. Third, consider becoming a patron. Patrons get early access to videos, they get to be a part of a patron-only Facebook group we call TAC Academy, and patrons can participate in the book club that meets on Zoom once a month. The link to become a patron is in the description. Thanks to all my current patrons for your support. Enjoy the interview. Welcome to The Analytic Christian. I'm Jordan, and this is the channel that helps you explore Christian philosophy and theology. Today we're going to be talking about fine-tuning, but a particular type of fine-tuning that you may not be familiar with, uh, the fine-tuning for discoverability. And my guest is Dr. Robin Collins, a professor at Messiah University. So thank you very much for joining me, Dr. Collins. All right, you're welcome. Gl glad to be here. So a few years ago, maybe six years ago, if I, it seemed like it came out in 2016, there was this book that came out, God and Cosmology. It was the written version of this public debate that you were a part of between right, Ron right. and Sean Carroll. You have a chapter in that book on the fine-tuning for discoverability, and there you lay it out and defend it against some objections. I thought it'd be good to bring you on and discuss that with you. So first, let me ask, can you give a, uh, how did you get involved in that debate? And what made you decide to write on this type of fine tuning as opposed to maybe the type that most people know you for this, this more general uh, type of fine tuning? Well, um, <clears throat> it was in 2000. 10, I was looking at the various cases <clears throat> of fine-tuning in the physical arguments form. So I was looking at the physics in particular, and I was looking at the fine structure constant, which is um, governs the strength of the electromagnetic force. It's, if you're familiar at all with any basic physics, there's, it's kind of the analog of the gravitational, Newton's gravitational constant, big G, that helps determine the force of gravity um, between any two masses, like your body and the Earth. So I was looking at that and looking at what the potential effects would be. And what I found is that if you increase that by very much a relatively small amount, you couldn't have open wood fires. And if you didn't have open wood fires, it'd be far less likely that you would be able to discover how to smelt metals or forge metals. So it'd be far less likely that um, human beings would have ever had science at all that we know of it, because that's all dependent on metals and you wouldn't have any metals. So that by finding that out kicked off um, the Bronze Age, which bronze has copper which has the lowest melting point and so that so that all gave rise to our scientific technology without that we would be in you know if you ever watched the flintstones the um <clears throat> would be in the stone age and permanently there so it looked like that constant was adjusted just right for scientific discovery now i already had written on for the privileged planet book a little short section for that book on how the laws of nature seemed to be structured in a precise way so that we could discover them. Now, that's not original with me, that part. I gave some maybe original examples of that, but that's a well, um, um, that's a thesis that most famously was articulated by Eugene Wigner in his um, article that's published all over the place. You can easily get it on the internet. Um, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences. And Wigner was one of the major founders of the modern physical theory, which is the core of the um, physical theory of quantum mechanics. And Einstein said similar things. He said the mo most miraculous thing about the universe is this intelligible at all. So the ability to discover the laws of nature and how they seemed adjusted to do that has been noticed by others. What hasn't been noticed is that the fundamental parameters of physics 
um, which that such as, you know, a fundamental parameter, a near fundamental parameter would be like the mass of the proton or the mass of the neutron. Um, they're not quite fundamental, but they give you an idea what they are. And that those things were adjusted just right so that we could, you know, do science. Yeah. So that was kind of the first. And then um, I began to pursue that more and found out the next big case I found out was the, um, with has to do with the cosmic microwave background radiation. And it's a bit of a puzzle to physicists why what's called the baryon to photon ratio, which is the number of neutrons plus protons, so the number of photons in the universe, which has been pretty constant. It's a cosmological number that remains constant. Why that is a value it is, is there's about um, a billion photons for every one baryon or pho um, neutron or proton. And so it was a puzzle of cosmology. And then I calculated, well, I thought, well, um, let's see how that ratio will affect the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the key tool for cosmology. Um, that is because um, that's a radiation, a microwave radiation that comes from all directions. And I first made a calculation in the fall of 2000, um, I think it was 2011, I made the calculation and I thought I'd, re uh, you know, I was, I was heading towards this thesis, well, maybe the parameters are fine tuned to optimize discovery. So I made the calculation. I made a mistake in the calculation. I thought I refuted my thesis. Uh -huh. So I gave up on it and just continued on and other things. And then the spring of 2012, I recalculated. I realized the mistake I'd made, went and recalculated. And lo and behold, it was there was a curve that it would um, it peaked out. The cosm um, when you um, calculated the amount of intensity of the cosmic microwave background radiation compared to the baryon to photon ratio within experimental error, we were right at the peak. So then I sent that off to a couple friends of mine who are cosmologists who verified it. And one of them said it was really amazing result because it's just like, wow, you didn't you know, expect this. And so then I spent a couple years looking for other cases as impressive. Now, I did find a lot of cases that were consistent with it, but I didn't find any as impressive as that until, um, and then I gave a uh, talk on it. That's the talk you're referring to mm. because it seemed to hold up in other parameters. And then Sean Carroll, you know, he's a physicist at, um, cosmologist at um, uh, Caltech, and he objected to it that about, about particle physics, but I hadn't really looked at because I thought it would be too difficult to look at. But then I would, I afterwards I was able to answer his objection. I think effectively making a simple distinction. He said that here was essence of his objection. Hey, the Higgs boson was really really hard to discover. So if it was much less massive, it would have been much easier to discover. So it seemed to, you know, initially refute the thesis. But then I did some research on the Higgs boson, and then I found a major worker on the field saying, well, there was two stages to using the Higgs boson. There was the first stage of discovering it, and admittingly that was hard. But then the second stage, which is the more important stage, was using the decays, measuring the decays of the Higgs boson to test the limits of the standard model, which is what physicists are concerned with. And he said the mass of the Higgs boson was um, born under a very lucky star so that we could do that. It was right in the right mass range. So then with that distinction, it wasn't about discovering the particular parameter or whatever, its value, rather it was about um, the discoverability was being able to find out about the fundamental structure, not just these particular values of things. So really, once you made that distinction, um, it that whole objection disappeared. So then I got into looking into particle physics from there, because advantage of particle physics is that um, you could cleanly separate out what's called life 
effects on life from those undiscoverabilities was really after is seeing if that there was um, a fine tuning for discoverability over and above that for life. In other words, you have the life permitting range, and then there was a much smaller range for the parameter that was optimal for discovery and whether the parameter was in that range. Mm -hmm. And particle physics formed the ideal test case for that because there's a wide range of values that's calculable for the particle. The fundamental masses, now we're talking about quarks and leptons, which are the fundamental particles in the standard model. And there's a limit to how um, their range. And within that limit, there's whether they're here or there in that within that range doesn't affect life. So then what I wanted to see was in that anthropic range, whether there was small subregion that um, was just right, uh, maximize scientific discoverability. And then I gave a talk after that at Baylor. And then I got a small grant from the Templeton Foundation through another program. And then in 2016, I got a large grant yeah, and you know it went through peer review, so other physicists looked at it and whether there was something to this, and they agreed, you know, there was potential here. So since then, I've been finishing off that project, and now I'm in the very last stages of it, and it all worked out. I That's can tell great. you that. Yeah. Now the thesis evolved just a little bit from the original one. The original one's not incorrect; they're just a deeper pattern, and that is there is a pattern of fine tuning not just for scientific discovery, but that we can discover the discovery. So I call it the discoverability of discoverability thesis. Mm. So it, right. and, and it appears to be about a fine tuning of um, within the particle physics cases, when you add that to the cosmic, that one cosmic case, about one in a hundred trillion over and above the other ones. And a lot of what we take to be fine tuning actually for life um, some of those are fine tuning for dis discoverability, also. Mm. Uh, particularly the low entropy of the um, initial state of the universe is really a fine tuning for discovery. And once you recognize that, it answers an objection that was raised to the other fine tuning argument. So, anyhow, that's pretty much a, just a brief sketch of the whole. Yeah, whole yeah. Thing. I'm glad you took the first few minutes. So, those that are watching, if you you might've gotten lost in the weeds. He's not trying to, you're not trying to like break everything down right now. You just wanted to kind of sketch what led you to get into Yeah, what led me to get into the project. So I saw a lot of potential Yeah, yeah. here. And, and I should also say, why, why is this significant over and above the fine tuning for life? And one of the big significances I recognized right away is it couldn't be explained by the multiverse hypothesis. If you know anything about the fine tuning for life, you know that everything's precisely set in the universe in just a hugely precise way, like one part in a billion, 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 go on that way for a while so that life can occur. And the leading alternative hypothesis, other than theism, is the multiverse hypothesis. Um, people like Stephen Hawking advocated this, Max Tegbark at MIT advocates it, the former. Um, the um, astronomer royale, Martin Rees of Great Britain advocated. So it's widely advocated. And that's the idea. There's just a huge number of universes generated by some physical process. And every time the universe is generated, these fundamental parameters, like I said, the mass of the proton, are their values are chosen at random. And so you get enough universes, it's... Um, you're eventually going to get one that the parameters are just set right for life. If it got enough variation in enough universe, if you have a huge number of them, it's like if you pr print enough lottery tickets, eventually one of them is going to turn out to be the winning number. Okay, same idea. And then, so that explains, the idea is that explains why there is a life-permitting universe. And then why do we observe the universe to be life-permitting? That's what's called the observer selection effect. And the idea there is, is we, in order to exist, the universe would have to be life permitting, would have to be fine tuned for life. 
And so we couldn't observe anything else. An analogy is often given to this. It says, well, why is our planet um, the right distance from the sun? You know, on a purely naturalistic basis without thinking God designed it. Um, why does it have all these special features that allow for life? Well, if you have enough planets, eventually one's going to be just the right distance from the sun, have right features. And then the life that arises on there is going to look and say, well, man, isn't our planet just right? But the easy explanation for why it is, is you couldn't have existed on any other planet. You couldn't have come, you couldn't have evolved on Mercury. You're a planet like Mercury or Venus. So of course you're going to observe it, the right distance from the sun. Mm -hmm. So that's the multiverse objection. And so that is the leading alternative. A lot of people advocate that. Where this um, fine tuning for scientific discovery cannot um, explain that, take away that coincidence. There will be a universe, um, if there's enough universes, that's just right for scientific discovery. So that's true. That part of the coincidence, it can take away. But it can't take away the coincidence of why I find myself in such a universe. Like suppose, uh, as a, um, a, a analogy, suppose I, um, um, you know, flip a coin a hundred times in a row and it comes on heads. I'm going to suspect there's some the coin is weighted or something, right? Now it's mm -hmm. true that there's some universe in which somebody flips a coin. If there's a, many enough universes and enough habit inhabitants. Somebody's going to flip a coin and it's going to come up 100 times in a row on heads, even though that's enormously unlikely. Okay, so that's true. But what's not true is what the coincidence is that I am the person that does it. Observe it. That's what's coincidental. And that's what this multiverse hypothesis couldn't take away. If we allowed it to take away that, then almost any coincidence could be explained, explained away. Like another example. Uh, everyday example, if I went to Deadsville, Nevada, gambled, and every time, you know, on the roulette wheel, I lost lots of money because every single time it just happened to be that the house won. And I go up to the, you know, manager there and I say, look at you've rigged the table. He says, oh, no, you know, many, many, many universes. Uh, you know, it's going to happen somewhere where no one would buy that because why is it happening here? So it's the same idea. Now applied that to discoverability. Why are we? There's still a coincidence left that we are in a universe that seems to be optimally discoverable. So mm -hmm. it doesn't take that coincidence away, and so we can't really explain it because it, theism can take the coincidence away if you assume that there's some value for a universe being discoverable. Because if you can clip some value in that. And since God creates a you know a, a perfectly good God would create the world to optimize um, or realize moral and aesthetic values. So if there's some good that's realized from that, then it wouldn't be surprising. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the, how the argument gets completed out. Yeah, yeah. So you've given a good sketch so far, and I want to maybe go step by step so the audience can follow. I followed because I've read the the essay. And so I, I know the kind of structure, the way, the way the argument goes, but I want to make sure I, I keep the audience with us. So um, let's see. So far, you just said, here's how I got into the argument. And here's why this argument's significant. The big point is the multiverse objection when conjoined with the observer selection principle doesn't, it, it's not enough to explain away the coincidence of uh, that the argument's uh, pointing to it seems like we're yeah, still discoverability to... yeah 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 in this case it's discoverability it seems like uh it's not a very good explanation for the discoverability but i want to make sure we unpack that slowly so the audience follows first let me make sure that we're clear on the main thesis of the paper of the of the argument you're making seems like you're what you're ultimately arguing for is um that not only are the parameters uh, such that you can have life, but within uh, so there's there's like a range at which 
life can exist. But within that already narrow range at which life can exist, um, there's an even narrower range at which the parameters have to be such that we can uh, have scientific discoveries. Um, and or it's that it's so optimized. Yeah. It's optimized for science. It's not just we can have them. It's optimal as far mm -hmm. as we can tell. Yeah, yeah. And so <clears throat> uh, it's this very narrow range that falls uh, to where, yeah, it, I like that you use the word optimal. So it's both livable and uh, discoverable, and those two are such that the overlap is optimal. Right. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, okay. uh, the discoverability range, optimality range, has to be in the livability range. Right, right, because right. You, if you, if we, preachers like us couldn't exist, we couldn't discover anything. Sure, sure. Right. So that seems to be, that optimality seems to be the the main th uh, phenomenon, I guess, that, right. that you're seeking to explain. And you want or to establish say, well, and then explain. What did you say? Establish and then explain. Right. Yeah. So you want to establish it and then explain it. Yes. Yes. Uh, now, you mentioned earlier. Um, well, we've said it a few times. Discover a few times. Discoverability. But when when we say that, what exactly do you have in mind? Like the fact that we can discover laws of physics at all, or yeah, no, that it, th yeah, it's that really the tools are optimal for it. So that you can imagine, you know, if you're using the cosmic microwave background radiation to explore the universe, it's uh, that tool is um, the more intense within limits that radiation is, the better it's going to be as a tool to use at, to discover the universe. So if it's going to be optimal, you want the radiation to be of all um, highest intensity it could be. So mm -hmm. it's really focuses on the tools of discovery, that those tools are optimal. So another tool of discovery would be the light microscope. And when you combine that with having science, what you actually find out is there's an optimality there, um, is that if <coughs> the light microscope is you have to have that to see living cells. You can't use electron microscopes for that because you have to put everything in a vacuum, kill them. So, and then I looked at, and what happens with the fine structure constant, if you increase it, if you increase it much more beyond where it is, you can't have any open biomass fires and therefore you wouldn't even have science. But if you start decreasing it, you've got another problem. Like for example, with the light microscope, it's resolving power goes down. And it happens to have just enough resolving power. The maximum resolving power for a light microscope is 0.2 millionths of a meter. And that happens to be the smallest living cell. So you're just on the edge mm -hmm. and you're in this optimality zone. You, if you make it much higher, yeah, maybe your light, light microscope could have a higher resolving power, but you never have light microscopes because you couldn't forge metals. Mm -hmm. And if you make it lower, your resolving power decreases. And then there's other effects of decreasing, um, both increasing and decreasing the fine structure constant. So it's in this kind of optimality range. Yeah, it's yeah. not just a matter of discovering it; it's that it's alt, all, um, optimum for discovery. Yes. Okay. I see. Then what I call the discernible discoverability optimality range. The range right. which you can now, discern optimality. You um, you gave a couple of examples to when you were describing like how you got into this, but. What are some specific examples of fine tuning for discoverability? Well, that was the cosmic microwave background radiation was one of them. I could go through that again. No, 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 that's fine. Um, no, there was the the one with the fine structure constant. Yeah, you mentioned that briefly at the beginning because that's uh, with with uh, so there's two ends to that, right? So if you increase that fine the fine structure constant. It seems like you run into the problem with you can't forge 
uh, fires. Yeah, metals, right? Because you can't have open wood fires. You can't have open. Yeah, yeah. And there's you a can't reason. Have open wood fires. That's the one that is the most understandable. The reason why, you know, I could maybe go through that. Um, most of us in the audience, I'm sure, have had experience of standing around a wood fire. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and you know the words that is combusting. So there's energy given off by combustion. And then that energy goes to two places, convection out in smoke, right? That's part of where the energy goes, but it also goes out in what's called radiation. So that's why you stand back from the fire, you feel warmth, you feel it radiating energy on you. And there has to be a balance there. So the energy from combustion has to um, that's coming in, being generated, has to equal the energy going out in convection and radiation. Now, probably never thought about this, but what governs the amount of energy that's coming out in radiation? Well, one factor, of course, is the temperature. But why at the temperature, let's say it's at, you know, 800 degrees Fahrenheit is burning at, why at that temperature is it giving out this amount of radiation instead of some other? Well, that is governed by the fine structure constant. Increase the fine, if you would double the fine structure constant, twice as much energy would come out of the fire. If you made it one half, one fourth, because it's proportional to the square of the fine structure constant. Mm. And you can use a unit, it's simple units to use for this is what's called co atomic units. You can easily show it in those units. And, but at the same time, in those units, the energy released by combustion remains the same. And same way with convection. So if you, double the fine structure constant, and let's say it was burning at 800 degrees, then it's an equilibrium, meaning there's much, before you doubled it, it's an equilibrium. There's as much combustion energy being produced as there is energy going out in radiation and convection. But now by doubling the fine structure constant, there's now four times as much going out in radiation. So there's no longer a balance. There's too much going out in radiation. The only thing that can happen is the temperature of the fire goes down. When the temperature goes down, the combustion rate goes down. And very quickly, the fire will just go out. It will go out below the combustion rate. It can't sustain itself. Mm -hmm. So that's why increasing the fine structure constant has that effect. And you can actually, if you look at, just go to Google and look at pictures of wood fires, what you can see, you can see it's actually, it's at a very nice point, actually, because, the, you know, if you turn a log over like this and it's charred, it's still, when it gets, when the two logs are against each other, pointing to each other, and they're, they'll both be burning on those sides. But the side that's not getting any radiant energy back goes out, even though it's getting plenty of oxygen. So why is that? Because it's radiating too much energy, uh, more than it can sustain. So what you have is um, the reason you can keep the fire going is because a piece of wood on the you know that's close to it is giving it energy back. And then the reason you can light fires is because in the initial ignition stage, like by a kindling, the initial ignition initial stage of ignition it hasn't charred yet and when it hasn't charred the combustion rate is about twice as much so then the radiant loss isn't enough to put out the fire but once the charred surface happens it is mm -hmm. and so that's also nice because if it wasn't the case if you got it too much lower then the surfaces would remain burning so if a lightning um, hit a tree, then it wouldn't go out. Typically, it would go out because it doesn't have any wood against it. Just like if you put you had a wood floor in a house, you put gasoline on it, you lit yeah, it, yeah. it wouldn't actually light the house on fire because it would just go out. Mm. It only time is when it can get, has to get energy back. Like if you put a cigarette in a non-fireproof couch, it's going to get, the radiant energy is going to come back or if it's between two beams. Mm. And so that's very nice for houses not burning down and not having, you know, that you minimize the risk of forest fires and things like that. So um, that it actually goes out. So that's another sort of um, fortuitous sort of thing for 
our civilization that doesn't have anything itself to do with life. Mm -hmm. So that aspect of the fine structure constant is fine tuned for this kind of uh, optimality. Right. But um, that's if you crank it up. But um, I believe you said when you crank it down, it's not, it doesn't come with so much of the cost with, with fire. Uh, it seemed, if I recall, it had something to do with microscopes. It was yeah, that light, my, the light, my, when you crank it down, the resolving power of light microscopes decreases in proportional to how much you crank it down. So it's purport, the resolving, if you made it one half, then instead of being um, um, two, instead of being 0.2 millionths of a meter um, microns, the word for it, um, the resolving power would be now 0.4. So it wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to resolve something near as, as small. Um, that's one effect. Another effect is um, electric transformers very rapidly become very inefficient. So uh, transformers like your computer, you plug in, you know, to the wall, and it transforms the voltage to, you know, usually about nine volts. So anything you power up your cell phone, it's, you know, the voltage coming out of the wall is 120 in America. So mm -hmm. it transforms it down. And those things can get warm. And the reason they get warm is they're not 100% efficient. But if you made the fine structure constant, let's say half, one half of what it was, the amount of energy lost in just heat would be four times as much because it goes with the square. And um, motors, likewise. And, you know, then you've got the big transformers that you see on the power lines out there because they're at, like power lines you see are about a, maybe 500,000 um, watts up uh, 500,000 volts, and that has to all get transformed down, transformed up, and then transformed down where you need to use it. So that's another effect. So then there's a couple other effects, but those are some of the main ones. So yeah, yeah, I think those decreasing those it hurts really technology, basically. Mm -hmm. So we're in a point where if it's much larger, you increase it and improves things, improves the efficiency of the transformer, but you don't dare increase it very much because then you wouldn't even have science at all and you wouldn't ever have a transformer. Mm -hmm. So it's in this kind of optimality zone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so just to kind of sum up to this point, and then we're kind of we're going to shift to the the es the explanation of this part. But right. um, just to sum up at this point, you have um, certain laws, and these laws have parameters in them. The parameters are such that there's a very narrow range at which you can have life. But right. within that very narrow range at which you can have life, you have a range where we can have uh, the kind of tools we need for scientific discovery. Right. And it just so happens uh, that there's this kind of uh, optimal balance between those right. where um, you can have tools and be livable and, and the, it's kind of this optimal range. But um, so that's the phenomenon that we're uh, seeking to explain. And you gave some examples of, of, to demonstrate that that yeah, really, these were the earliest features. these were the earliest examples they're not philosophical or the uh, scientifically actually the most powerful the mm. ones that are those are ones from particle physics but then there are, most of those are harder to understand not all of them so that led me into particle physics and there i found the kind of evidence the really strong evidence i was looking mm. for like in the cosmic micro bank background radiation case stuff like that right right and you do mention that in the in the chapter of the bit about the cosmic microwave but with that curve because i remember seeing yeah, the graph and that one but that was before i really got into particle physics that was 2014 okay so then i got into particle physics and once i got into particle physics then i applied for the grant like it was a quarter million dollar grant and gave me time off from teaching to work on this and it had a co-investigator was a particle physicist and that was a lot more difficult because I had to learn particle physics and got into particle physics. So, but it did in the end all pan out. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the pattern um, goes down to that level. It just is not as easy to explain. There's one case I probably could explain 
fairly yeah, easily. Well, why don't we, um, I said we'd go for about an hour. So why don't you take a few minutes and, and pick, pick one. I know it may be a little hard, but I'll try to, I'll try the, the to. Muon, the muon is probably the easiest case to understand. And I have to give you a little background in particle physics. Um, there's what's called the standard model of particle physics. That's our basic physical theory right now of fundamental particles. So particle physics deals with the most fundamental particles. Um, we used to think, you know, maybe, I don't know, 80 years ago, it looked like, let's say, the proton, neutron, and electron were fundamental. But then we found out the proton was composed of, and neutrons are composed of what's called quarks. So the quarks are more fundamental. Mm -hmm. And then you have electrons. Um, but then it was found out there were other particles besides those that basically they are more massive. And because they're more massive, they have more energy, they decay away to a lower energy state. So very quickly, they all decay away. So those are called, um, they're called, they're almost identical except their mass. They're called second, like in the case of quarks, second and third generation quarks. And in the case of the electron, and this is an example I'll give it the case of electron, there's a particle, two particles that are otherwise identical in properties to the electron, but more massive. One of them's the muon. And that's 200 times as massive as the electron. Mm -hmm. And the other is the tau lepton, which is, um, let's say, 17 times as massive as the um, uh, muon. So it's um, it would be 3,400 times as massive as the electron. Okay. So that, that's the third generation one. So there's a whole, and then there's a Higgs boson is another particle. So there's an array of particles. So these particles, these higher energy particles or higher masses don't have any influence on life because they decay, most of them decay away in like less, less than a trillionth of a second. So they have no chance to do anything. They only exist in particle accelerators, mm -hmm. but they're very important. So one, when the muon was one of the first of these extra particles to be discovered and people famously said with the muon, well, who ordered that? And because it wasn't essential for life, well, why is that existing in the universe? And like Sean Carroll raised that objection. But these additional particles were essential to coming to understand the basic structure of matter, to understand the structure of the proton, even though they don't play any direct role. They, they have indirect effects, no direct role in life, but indirect effects by which help us determine the structure of the proton. You couldn't determine mm -hmm. the structure and the nature of that force directly. You really, until it was discovery of the charm quark, which is, um, it's almost a thousand times as massive as the proton. Until that discovery, we didn't even have, couldn't verify the existence of quarks. So we mm -hmm. wouldn't know about the structure. Okay, so that's one role they actually played in discovery. They were needed for discovery of the structure of the proton and neutron. But now I want to focus on a particular one, and that's the muon, because the muon is very interesting. It has an enormous number of uses. Um, and part of the reason for that is you could produce a huge number of them. And the reason why is it's, uh, um, it's slightly less massive. It's the lowest mass of, of the particles and slightly less massive than what's called the pion. And the pion, you can just by hitting big particles together, you could produce the enormous number directly of pions. You can't do that with muons. So you can produce a lot of muons because the pion decays to muons. Okay. So if it was slightly more massive, you would have far fewer muons to work with. That was the first thing. The second thing is so there's an enormous number of experiments that are, these are used in. They're used in medical. There's medical uses to them. One particular fascinating use, and there's an extra fine tuning here um, that I end up finding, is muons are used for imaging. Um, things like volcanoes, they've been used to image the pyramids. And that's because the cosmic rays, there's cosmic rays, which are basically protons, mostly just pro, uh, high energy protons. 
hitting the atmosphere. And when they hit the atmosphere, they hit like um, oxygen atoms or nitrogen atoms. And there it's like a collider. It's like the two collide together, produce lots and lots of energy, which in turn produces a shower, initial shower of pions, which didn't decay to muons mm -hmm. right away. And then the muons, they're such that they don't interact very much with matter unlike pions, so pions would be stopped, or like x-rays would be stopped. You couldn't put an x-ray through a pyramid. Mm. They can only go a, a limited distance. But muons interact very little with matter, except for leaving an ionization trail. So they don't lose very much energy. And what they do is they're constantly going through like your house. You Actually, there's an app for a phone you can get that records the muons coming through. So it's about you know one muon, per second, I think it's per second or minute maybe, per centimeter squared. So these are showering down. So they basically function as a giant x-ray machine because what you do is then you put a detector underneath in places that are thicker, um, fewer muons can get through than the ones that, you know, if there's like a pyramid and there's a chamber in the pyramid, then more muons get through that area where there's a chamber than get through the other parts. And so you'll see that on your imaging. So you've got, you can get x-rays of pyramids, which you'd never be able to otherwise find out, see that. So you could basically, and the x-rays are happening everywhere in the world. So you don't have to bring any special machines in. And so there's like companies that are starting now to, to do it for mining and things like that. There's been proposals of all that for, um, so that's like one of the uses, and it seems to be fine-tuned when I calculate to actually maximize its usefulness for that. And that's that, part of a implication of a discoverability of discoverability thesis. And that's a really a very small range that that allows that. It's like of its total possible range, it's like one part in ten thousand of its total possible range. So it's a it's a high level of fine-tuning. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm glad you took some some time to point to that. But that's only one of its uses. There's just a lot of stuff the muons are used for. Mm. A lot of experiments dealing with muons. And a lot of the key is how many of them are produced. So at this point, the structure of the argument is similar to the way that uh, maybe the type of fine tuning argument that people are more familiar with uh, right. would go. So you have this, this could be the result. This phenomenon could be explained by uh, design. So something like theism, right. Right? right. Or uh, something like chance. I don't know if somebody wants to, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the formulation that Craig uses though. I know you go with a, like a probabilistic version here, but um, still, still, You've you've got these candidate types of explanations. The best uh, chance, chance or multiverse. What did you say? Chance or multiverse. You could just say it by chance. You could say, well, it's just one in a trillion chance of that happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, that's pretty implausible to think that. And if you do the Bayesian analysis, that gives strong confirmation for the theistic hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So. so if someone tried to appeal to the multiverse to explain this, coupled with the observer selection principle, which is the type of move that's often made right. in, in other cases, that's not going to work here because uh, I know you gave the, the coin flipping analogy. I'll, right. I'll, maybe I'll just put it this way. Um, if you had whatever large number you have in mind to the, uh, for for one of these examples of uh, fine tuning at the level for scientific discovery, whatever large number that is, one out of that really big number, um, that would be like in my mind, uh, if you had a whole lot of uh, people that were living. So it's like, hey, we we exist in the kind of universe that can allow for life. So you got a whole lot of observers, but only one of them <laughs> ends up being able existing in a kind of universe where they could have the tools for scientific discovery. scientific discovery that's the idea so appealing to this multiverse with uh an observer selection principle won't help you here because you are still faced with incredible odds 
uh, it right. seems like highly improbable that you would be in the uh, one that was just one. right. You would be the one that not only has the conditions for livability, but also this optimal uh, right, conditions for, for scientific discovery. Okay, so it seems like that objection's not going to work here, which I think is a really interesting feature. Uh, well, a pro of this argument, it seems like it can overcome right. a really popular objection to fine tuning. But in the paper, you cover some other objections. Um, do you want to mention those here? Yeah, I can mention those here. One, people worry about, you know, the fine tuning for life, its falsifiability. Um, and well, you know, of course, we're going, we can discover that we're, you know, we don't live in a fine uh, universe that's not fine tuned for life. But here we could discover that we don't live in one that's optimal for discoverability. And several times I thought I had found that, but it turns out to be a calculational error. So first of all, it's falsifiable. Um, and so you could do a much more straightforward Bayesian analysis that's not problematic on it. Um, and um, that's one of the advantages. Um, that was one of the objections to the other one that's advantage here. Um, the other objection I commonly hear this is, well, of course, you you know, things are going to look like they're discoverable because if they weren't, you wouldn't have discovered them. Right. So if you go out in a field and you find 10 different coins, you know, use your metal detector and find, well, man, they were just right for discovery. Well, of course, I just went in just the right places. Some, you know, God must have led me into just the right places. Well, if there's a billion coins there in the field, well, of course, you wouldn't have found that particular coin unless it was you'd went in that spot. So unless the thing was discoverable, you wouldn't have found it. You wouldn't have known about it. That's the idea. So that's a kind of discoverability selection effect. Unless it's discoverable, you wouldn't have known about it. So of course, everything you find out about, you're going to find it's discoverable because you wouldn't have found out about it otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, okay. But the, the most straightforward reply to that, there's another reply, but the most straightforward is, I'm not arguing that it's the fact that it's discoverable. I'm arguing that it's optimal for discoverability. The cosmic microwave background radiation, we would have known about it even if it wasn't optimally intense. If it was thought weaker, we still would have known about it. We just would have known it wasn't optimal because mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't have had to be on that top of that curve. It could have been somewhere else. So it's the optimality. It's not that it's you discovered it. It's that it's opt. It, the tools are optimal for discoverability. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between that, and that can be explained by a discoverability selection effect. Yeah. What? Uh, here, here's an objection. I don't know. I, I thought of this as I was reading the chapter, uh, and I, I think you did address this at somewhere in the chapter, but that might be to say. Um, Look, we would have, uh, you know, if the conditions had been otherwise, we could have come up with tools suitable for those conditions. So maybe my light microscope wouldn't work or maybe fire wouldn't work. But um, there, there'd be other things that I could use instead. Of, like, Oh, well, Sean, Sean Carroll said that. Well, then like what? If you can burn, you know, um, biomass. Then how would you get something hot? Well, maybe radioactivity, but how are you going to discover radioactivity without the scientific technology? Well, maybe we could burn coal. Well, that is a form of biomass would run into the same problem. Or maybe we could trap solar energy like, you know, with a, with a um, magnifying glass. Well, and maybe keep think huge magnifying glass. Well, the problem is you wouldn't even be able to build a magnifying glass. So it's easy to say that, but when you actually ask, well, how would that be the case? You come up with nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's just complete fantasy. That's like, you know, maybe, you know, I could fly like Superman, you know, <laughs> I could fly without a plane. Well, you know, that's fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. You need to specify how you could do that. Now, if the world were entirely different, but different laws, that would be another matter. Sure. We yeah. can't say anything here, but we're talking about the laws we have. Yeah, and yeah. the laws we have only allow for a certain kind of things. So you might, you know, people could say, well, if you didn't have planes, 
you'd find some other way of finding, you know, getting across the ocean quickly. Well, if there was another way, we would have found it by now. There isn't any other way of getting fast across there, Mm -hmm. right? Um, You could maybe have transporters, but then that's a Star Trek world, not our world. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, that's how I respond to those. You actually look at it. You're far more restricted than you think you are, like the light microscope. Um, You have eyes. Eyes operate on radiation electromagnetic radiation there's really no alternative to electromagnetic radiation except for the electron microscope but that also um first of all required uh, light microscope to come first even know that the electron microscope has given you what you had but it also can't look at living things and we already have exhausted the alternatives you can't do that you can't see small things by sound which is the other sort of you have to have some mechanism where information gets transferred and you know we have our five sentences you got sight sound taste you're not going to be able to see small cells by taste you're not going to be able to see them by sound um you maybe see larger organs by ultrasound but not by just not real small things you can't you know the wavelength is too large so you just look at those and you can see immediately there wouldn't have been another method. And besides, even if there was at some point, we're talking about the method we have as being optimal. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so even apart from that, it's that being optimal. Um, so the best method, we know that's the best method because mm-hmm. if there was a better method, we would have found it. And then the question is, is it optimal or not? And it looks like it is optimal. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that objection works very well. People have raised it, but it's, I think if we think about it for a few minutes, you see that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. So that objection functions in a similar way to those who say, well, maybe our carbon-based life couldn't exist, yeah. but there could be other, right? Um, so there's there's objections that kind of have analogs to right. the objection that you'd see to a traditional but even you know there, the other thing with the carbon-based life, the actual fine-tuning is not based on carbon-based life. It's any kind of complexity. Mm-hmm. If you have like a cosmological constant too large, then the universe expands before stars and galaxies and stuff can form. So there's no clumps of matter to give for evolution to even occur on, whatever mm-hmm. kind of life there is. But as a matter of fact, also carbon-based or special properties of carbon and oxygen that are very ideal for life. So it'd be mm-hmm. inferior, quite inferior. Mm-hmm. And so that's where the, uh, I'm going back now to the, this argument about uh, optimality for scientific discovery. That's where that emphasis on optimality, even right. if there is some other way, we're talking about which way is optimal. And it looks like what we have here is the, are optimal. In the optimal kind of conditions. So maybe there is some other way with, volcanic you know piping through volcanic jets or something to heat up something to forge a metal but it's mm-hmm. certainly not very optimal you know, somebody have to get close to a volcano and buy it by the way well because if there was an easier way we would have found it mm-hmm. just like eventually we found coal for you know char- instead of charcoal eventually but that was after many many years of using charcoal to um, forge metals we had to have not only have a fire, but then you have charcoal that gives you carbon and you need that carbon to get rid of the purities. That's why most areas is because of the charcoal that there's no old growth forest. It wasn't building houses. It was just the enormous amount of wood that had to be used to, to forge metals to not only get the metal hot, but then to form the, the um, carbon in the charcoal to bring out the impurities to get it to actually the oxides to turn into metals. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to finish off the discussion here, we've uh, both given examples of the phenomena. uh, And then now we've looked at one, well, some object, uh, well, I don't want to say objections, some ways of explaining it that leave it looking like it's still really improbable. But there's right. an explanation that makes it look like, no, this kind of optimality, um, at the very least, it's not as improbable as what Other those... Theism. You can glimpse the reason why, why God would do it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So maybe I know you mentioned it briefly, but mention it here. Why on theism is this not as improbable as them? Because you could see some kind of value in developing technology and discovering the universe. I mean, um, God is, there's an intrinsic value to knowledge. You know, God's the ultimate knower and we're created in the image of God. So knowledge is valuable in itself. So there's just an intrinsic value to know. And that's why we're driven to know. I mean, why do we try to find out about the nature of the universe? Why do that, even though it's not going to give rise to any technology like, you know, cosmology? Because there's something in us that is driven to know, that values knowledge. So ask any, you know, why do cosmology, why build these particle accelerators? We're not going to cure cancer by them or anything. Well, there's some value in just finding out about the nature of things because we're made in the image of God and are knowers. So that's been part of the Christian tradition, like Aquinas talks about that. Mm-hmm. And also it shows that um, we it gives us, it's a way in which we can see how creation further glorifies God. That'd be another reason God would have done it that way. You know, when Paul talks about in Romans 1, he just hitting the very, you know, what they knew was not very much about the structure of the universe, but the more we find out, like it's a vastness, the more we see the eternality of God. So that discovering the in- ingenious structure of the universe points, it glorifies God because it points to, you know, the in- ingenuity of the creator. So you can give theological reasons like that for why God would have done it. And then in the, um, why make it optimal? Well, um, that. It's like in the heart of science is, you know, which is usually taken, some people take it as the kind of pillar of secularism, which it isn't at all. But in the heart of that, there's something, and what we take as the kind of way of getting knowledge about the world. There's something that points beyond itself to God. And other people have noticed that the miraculousness of its discoverability, they just haven't quantified it. What I did is tested that thesis in a quantifi- quantifiable way. Like I said, Eugene Wigner, Albert Einstein noticed this. But what's impressive about this is this thesis kind of tests the idea. If you really thought it was miraculous, the discoverability of these laws, then you would expect the parameters to be in a position that would maximize that. And so it kind of tests that thesis. Mm -hmm. Where you wouldn't expect that if it was just kind of an accident that happened. Yeah. So it's the test that the is the theistic explanation passes, but the other one doesn't. E- either naturalistic or multiverse doesn't pass. Mm-hmm. And I also should say I think this is also interesting for another reason. And it's got great theological interest because that means science was providential, not just a kind of a result of the creation of the universe. Some um side effect of some other aim of God. Mm, Like we think that a lot of people think that evil is a side effect of another aim of God to create free will creatures, but God didn't directly intend evil. So that's Mm -hmm. what I mean by a side effect. But And so you could maybe think that about our ability to do science, but if it's fine-tuned, this shows that it it was directly part of God's providential plan to have science, then that raises the question, why? And so, if the, you know, why would God have done this? So then mm-hmm. you get into a very deep theological issue. I have two questions left, and then we'll wrap up. I know we're coming up on time here. So what might you say to a skeptical theist who says, we are just not in a position to know what kind of reasons God has uh, in mind when he created the universe. And so uh, you say that it's more probable on theism that we would have this kind of optimality, but we're just in the dark on that. What, what, what might you say to a skeptical theist with that view? Well, I would say this to a skeptical theist. I do think we can discern, we can discern between things that are good and bad. 
And so if something's better, seems to be better than not, that gives us at least reason to think it's not surprising under theism. So maybe we can't know with certainty, and I would agree with that. We can, you know, God's mind is infinite. But if we can glimpse a reason, we might not know all the reasons God would have, but that gives us some reason um, to think that, the, you know, God might do that, and that renders it not highly improbable. It's like if you find, you know, people pointed this out, if, um, you know, when the, when um, after you'd find, I think when the Americans and the allies and back to Germany, they'd find all kinds of things that they didn't quite know the purpose of the machines. But so you didn't, you were kind of, you had a skepticism about the purpose. You couldn't discern the purpose. And yet they knew, they could glimpse that there was some reason. So they would know that they were designed and not just a result of chance because they could glimpse possible reasons why it would be there. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all that's necessary. That's off the top of my head, what I would say to the skeptical. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, last question here. I've heard for a while that you're writing, I think, a two-volume work. This is supposed to be the, the culmination yeah. of all your work on fine-tuning. Where are you at on that project? Well, this is, the, I mean, I moved on to fine-tuning for discovery because I thought it was such a game-changer because the most difficult problem I think with fine tuning is the um, the standard one is the multiverse hypothesis. And the second most difficult is maybe the, you know, Bayesian inference, you know, the problem of old evidence or something like that. And discoverability runs into neither of those problems. So I, you know, by 2000, oh, 12 or 13 or 14, I started moving way into that direction, trying to complete this project, because this is a game changer in that it, um, you, you can have philosophical debates for a long time how plausible a multiverse is. But if you can find something, a fine tuning that's really significant, the multiverse doesn't explain, then that just kind of does away with it. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of test of theism versus the multiverse. Is there a fine tuning that you could explain under theism, but not under multiverse? And I think that's what the fine tuning does. Yeah, yeah. So for, for discoverability, all your work on this newer uh, yeah. trajectory that you're on. When when will that be published? Well, my hope is okay. So this summer, I'm I'm giving a one day workshop at Rutgers university going over this and then i'm on sabbatical next year part of the year and so i hope to finish it i've kind of went through all the cases um and so hope to next year to to actually do the serious write-up of everything well that's really exciting thank you so much for doing this interview i've i've loved getting to talk to you about this argument it's really fascinating okay.